Out of depths of our struggles, we cry to the Lord. In the inner darkness, when we feel so alone, we cry to the Lord. Lord, hear our cry. We wait for the day of the Lord with patience and hopeful hearts. Lord, be with us today. Amen. As we gather here today, let us open our hearts, for faith has, and in faith we are set free. Free not to mind our words, but to speak the truth in love. Free not to look up at some and down at others, but to look kindly eye to eye. Free not to close our senses, but to feel clearly the pain of others and to take it to yourself. So clothe ourselves in Christ, the fashion of the heirs of promise and of praise God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, King of glory, faithful follower, we adore your name and glorify you forever. It is by your will that we are alive and healthy, and you have given us the grace to come to this place of worship. You promised us that whenever we call upon your name, you will answer us with your presence. Come into our midst, our Father, fellowship with us, visit with, our, with your overwhelming presence, and make your blessings abundance in our gathering today. From beginning to the end, glorify yourself and make us satisfied in you. In Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning to everyone. I am Joyce Mays, if you don't already know. The other elder for today would be Stacy Jones. We'd like to welcome everybody to Timberlake Christian Church, both here in person and those who are online. If this is your first time visiting with us, we'd like to thank you for coming, and we hope you'll be comfortable here. We look forward to spending the next hour or so worshiping together. Does anybody have any celebrations they would like to share? Ed? <laughs> yes. I saw another hand go up. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm, she's very glad to be here, I'm sure. That's right. Paige Truxell has had a little girl. Um, I don't remember her name. Nora Grace. Nora Grace. Laura, Nora Grace. Okay. And I think everybody is doing fine. And um, Kathy and um, Ken Truxell are, I'm sure, proud, proud oh, I can't even talk this morning, proud grandparents. Any other celebrations? Yes, ma'am. Wow, new babies, it's good to have new babies come along. All right, we have, uh, I think our announcements are in the, um, the bulletin and on the screen as well. We have every Monday, we have an equality justice vigil at 8 p.m. And uh, Thursdays, we have a prayer Zoom at 11.30. This Thursday, uh, 8.12, we have a cabinet meeting at 6.30. And um, that's the uh, lineup for next week. Yes.
Okay. All right. The uh, Equal Justice Vigil takes place at Monument Terrace every Monday night at 8 p.m. So if you'd like to attend, that's where you would go. And um, next Sunday we have the Mix at 9, Friendship Class at 10, Bethany Class at 1015, and our Traditional Worship at 11. Are there any other announcements? A choir at seven on Tuesdays. All right, so we will go to our prayer concerns. Oh, I guess the other announcement is that we'll have a re uh, installation of Reverend Ben Moore. That might be a <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not a prayer concern. <laughs> Double celebration, okay. I think it's a big celebration that we have found our, our next chapter in the history and life of Timberlake Christian Church. Okay, so we will do our prayer concerns. Let's see. September, September the 5th, it's on the back of your bulletin. September the 5th at 10 o'clock. Okay, our acute um, prayer list is Paul Childress, Betty Engeldove, Joyce Maddox, Hazel Palmer. We might move her to the, to the ongoing for right now. Uh, Joyce Sneed, uh, Paige Troxell, Terry Lucas, the aunt of Lucas Jones, who underwent surgery for breast cancer this past Wednesday. Is there anybody that we want to add to the acute list? All right, he said that Joyce did have a heart attack and 100% blockage, and so I guess they will be doing s surgery or test or... So they can't do the stent, so we will ask for many prayers for her. Our ongoing prayer list is Kim and Danny Brooks, Walker Hill, Kim Miller, Nancy Moore, the niece of Glenn Shrewsbury, Carolyn Miller, Ray Lynn, Amy Maddox's daughter, Randy Maddox Jr., Freddie Padilla, employee of Don Rezai, Dana Kidd, Don, Don Rezai's sister, Judy Thompson, sister-in-law of Jackie Maddox and Bev Maslow, Vicki Willis, mother of Carla Jones, good friend Nikki Willis, Becky Truxell, Kent Truxell's mother, and Tristan, son of Bill Spangler Dunning, our regional minister, and John Vasbury. Yes, Ed? Yes, sir. Uh, Ray Lynn uh, was at church this morning at the early service. Wow, great. Amy, Amy Fantastic. Fantastic. Joyce also said that Tristan, Bill Spangler Dunning's son, they did find out he's going to need radiation once he moves to New York. Uh, but he is, he's doing well. They're just doing a couple of treatments for radiation. Okay, Tristan is moving to New York, you said? Mm -hmm. And as soon as he gets there, he'll do some more radiation treatments. And the, but he's doing well. Anyone else to add to that? And if you'd like to add anybody that you have not mentioned to our prayer list, you can see me after the service or those online can call the church office. Let us go to God in prayer. At every moment of life, you are present, O oh God, in sickness and in health, in sorrow and in joy, in tragedy and celebration. Yet at no single moment are you more needed than now in this pain and suffering that we have mentioned. Make your holy presence felt to those we have mentioned today and those who are in our hearts. May our prayer for them reverberate beyond the boundaries of earth to the heavens above. Let every angel hear us. May every soul recognize that healing powers are needed today at this place in time. Let your blessings reign. 
All of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm reading this morning from John 6. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Jewish opposition grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They asked, isn't this Jesus, Joseph's son, whose mother and father we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus responded, don't grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless they are drawn to me by the Father who sent me, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has listened to the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. I assure you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert, in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that whoever eats from it will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And from 2 Samuel, The king gave orders to Joab, Abishai, and Ittai. For my sake, protect my boy Absalom. All the troops heard what the king ordered regarding Absalom to all the commanders. So the troops marched into the field to meet the Israelites. The battle was fought in the Ephraim forest. The army of Israel was defeated there by David's soldiers. A great slaughter of 20,000 men took place that day. The battle spread out over the entire countryside, and the forest devoured more soldiers than the sword that day. Absalom came upon some of David's men. Absalom was riding on a mule, and the mule went under the tangled branches of a large oak tree. Absalom's head got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair while the mule went up under him, kept going. Then ten young armor bearers of Joab surrounded Absalom, struck him, and killed him. Then the Cushite arrived and said, My master, the king, listen to this good news. 
The Lord has vindicated you this day against the power of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, is my boy Absalom okay? The Cushite answered, may the enemies of my master the king and all who rise up against you to hurt you end up like that young man. The king trembled. He went up to the room over the gate and cried. As he went, he said, oh, my son Absalom, oh, my son. My son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. May God bless the reading of this word. Sorry, I'm having a few microphone problems. He realized that he had been talking to a bird. Travel writer and theologian Jeff Chu wrote about his time studying at the farminary. If you don't know what a farminary is, that's okay, most of us don't. The farminary is a farm that is associated with Princeton Theological Seminary. The students of the seminary go out and work the fields of the farm to learn more about agriculture because you can't really understand much of what Jesus says unless you've done some work in agriculture. So many of Jesus's parables are with agriculture. And Jeff Chu said while he was out at the farminary one day, he looked over and saw this large bird come flying in and land not too far from him. And he was surprised that the bird seemed to take no notice of him. It didn't spook easily. And so he got out his phone and downloaded the Audubon Society's app to figure out what kind of bird it was. He said it, it was just so interesting. So he opened the app up and took a picture and immediately the Audubon Society told him, that's a killdeer. He said, okay, and he read up on what a killdeer was and eventually the bird flew off and he went about his day. A few days later, he was out again working at the farminary when a killdeer flew in and landed right by the gate he was getting ready to go into. He said, I couldn't believe how close the killdeer was and how it didn't spook at all. And so he pulled out the app knowing that the Audubon Society app will use your phone to make bird calls. And so he played a bird call of a killdeer and the killdeer responded. And it has five different sounds. So he hit one sound and the killdeer responded and then he hit another sound and the killdeer responded and a different sound and he got through all five sounds and he just kept going. He thought this is just incredible. He was having a great time. Just he'd hit a sound and the killdeer would say something. And for five or 10 minutes, he kept making these bird calls on his phone and the killdeer would respond. He said, finally, the killdeer looked at him as though bored and just flew off. The killdeer apparently decided it was tired of hearing those same five things. The story wasn't going anywhere. And so off it went. And he said, as the bird flew off, he realized that he'd been talking to the bird. When he pulled the phone out, he thought, oh, I can make my phone make noises and it will make noises back. And from his perspective, he was simply making noises and the bird was making noises. It was only after that he realized, hold on, the bird was trying to talk to me. I was trying to get the bird to make noises. And he realized how different his own perspective was than that of the bird. He doesn't know what he said to the bird or what the bird said back. But the bird knew. Those noises mean something. And the bird wanted to have a conversation. How often have we been like that in our own lives? Where somebody else just wants to talk to us but we can't hear. We don't listen. Don't look at your spouses right this second. It's not the time. We just need to know that we're heard, that we're listening, that we're paying attention. But our own perspective so often can keep us from being attentive to what's going on. In this morning's gospel reading, it's easy to forget that the crowds that are there following Jesus, they're there because of the feeding of the 5,000. They had been present they had received the bread and the fish that should not have fed 10 people, much less 
5,000 or 15,000 or however many it fed. They have followed Jesus because of that miracle. And yet, where are they in this scripture? They are no longer following Jesus. Now they are those who contended with Jesus. Those people who had followed him in order to argue with him. They're fighting with him. They're disagreeing with him. They're saying this guy thinks he knows who he is. They have gone from wanting more of that miraculous feeding of the bread and the fish to saying, you're nothing special. We know your parents. Well, we know your mom. I often wonder when I read of people telling Jesus, you're Joseph's son, if there's a Joseph's son because of the rumors about Jesus' parentage that surely went around Nazareth and Galilee. They're mocking him. They have gone in just this short period of time from being those who wanted whatever it was Jesus would give him, them because they knew the miracle of what he had done to being those who are mocking him saying, you can't be from heaven. You can't be from God. We know your parents. It's Joseph and Mary. We know your siblings. We know where you grew up. We know that you are not come down from heaven. How often in our own lives do we make that kind of switch? How often in our own lives do we say, if we get the bread, we talked about last week, you push that button, you get the bread, you keep pushing the button, right? Whatever that good thing is that it is that we want, if we can figure out how we keep getting it, we just keep doing it. But then when we stop getting the bread or when something more is asked of us, do we change our mind? Do we change our opinion? Do we say, oh, I thought he was something special, but it turns out I know his parents. And he thinks a bit too much of himself. How often do we look at Jesus when he starts saying things we don't like? Now, we don't often hear Jesus speak to us, so we can't argue with him in the ways that the crowds did. And so we do something different now. We just ignore it. If Jesus says something we don't like, if there is something in Scripture that we disagree with that may make us uncomfortable or require us to change our ways of living, just brush past it. I'm not interested in that part. I'm not going to pay attention to that part. I'm not going to listen because that's wrong. And here's the thing. I'm not saying this to say, gosh, we're all terrible people. That's the way the human brain works. It wants to be able to brush past the things that we don't want to hear. It wants to be able to move beyond the things that would require us to change how we are. In the gospel reading, the people who followed Jesus, as soon as he starts challenging them, as soon as he starts saying, well, then you've got to follow me. You've got to let go of your own understanding of things. You have to be willing to do some things that you may not want to do. They go from wanting that bread that he's got to being like, I'm not interested. Who do you even think you are? They ate the bread. How many of us would have wished to have been there at the feeding of the 5,000? Have read that story and thought, what an amazing thing it must have been. 24 hours later, and those people are against Jesus. Because he says, I am the bread of life. But only the Father can draw you to me. Only God can draw you to me. Jesus isn't saying that as some sort of election or some sort of chosenness. Jesus isn't looking around at the crowds and going, all right, you're chosen, you're chosen, you're chosen, you're chosen. The rest of y'all too bad. God doesn't love you. Jesus is saying, only if you're willing to humble yourself and allow God to draw you to me in a new and different way, only when you're willing and able to do that, to get out of your own way, will you be drawn to that which gives bread that does not spoil, that gives life everlasting. 
That invitation is there for us, but we have to get out of our own way. We have to humble ourselves. We have to unlearn many of our old ways to learn new ways. Look at the story in 2 Samuel. As that story was being read this morning, as Elsie read that story, I thought, as I have many times reading that story, how do the soldiers not get it? David says very clearly at the beginning, spare my son, my boy, my child. For my sake, spare him. How do they not understand a father's love for a child, a parent's love for a child? How can they not hear the tenderness in David's, my boy, my beloved? And instead they go off, and when they find Absalom helpless, they don't spare him, they destroy him. They kill him. And they come back to David as though that is good news. As though that is something worthy of celebrating. As though he will celebrate as well. How do they miss it? How do they not get it? But it's easy to look at this story and and make them the other. Make them the ones who are just so dense. But in our own lives, we miss it all the time because of the way that we think. Because of the way that we see the world. I got to confess to y'all, I can be pretty petty. Anybody else here can be petty? I only got a couple hands. Come on, (laughs) y'all. When something bad happens to somebody that has done something bad to me or something bad happens to somebody I don't like, there's, there's a little glee, right? So I think there's a word, shade and fraud. That's a big word that I can't even say right, but I think that's what shade and fraud is. is you see something bad happen to somebody else that you think deserves it, and, and you take some joy in it. We can all be like that. All of us can see things happening and think, thank goodness, finally justice is done. Goodness has happened. This is what needed to happen. But that's exactly what the soldiers thought about Absalom. Because they didn't have ears to hear. They had their own way of seeing the story, their own perspective. They didn't realize they were talking to a bird. They used different words and different understandings. They saw Absalom not as my son, not as my beloved but as the one who had chased David out of Jerusalem and sought to annihilate David's rule and David himself. And so they sought to kill him, even though David had begged them for his sake to spare him. They didn't understand what it was that David was saying because they were so caught up in their own understanding of things. And i got to be honest, y'all, I get like that in the heat of an argument. I can only imagine what it must be like as a soldier, as one who has fought hand to hand, sword to sword against those who sought to destroy my master. How much that must become ingrained that I must fight and kill in that setting. But when we look at David and Absalom, we have to remember that David's love for Absalom is God's love for each of us. That David's love for Absalom may not seem justified, may not seem rational, may not seem like the way things should be or go. But that is God's way. That is God's love. Looking at each and every one of us and calling each and every one of us a beloved child. My child. My beloved. When God moves us and calls us toward Jesus, it is toward the way of seeing each other as God's child. Seeing each other as God's beloved, no matter who it is. But that takes a lot of imagination sometimes, y'all. It's not easy, right? 
there are some people, and as soon as I say this, y'all are going to have an image pop in your mind. There are some people that it is hard to believe might be God's child, might be God's beloved. I don't have to name names. Y'all got them in your head. But whoever it is that popped into your head, God's beloved child. God loves the people we hate. That is the way of Jesus Christ. It is the way that God seeks to draw us toward. But we've got to get out of our old ways of thinking. We've got to quit thinking that we know the way that things have to be, the way things should be, the way things will be, and instead seek the way that God wants them to be. We've got to quit thinking we know where Jesus has to come from or speak from or be from. And instead say, is that voice that I'm hearing, are those words that I'm hearing, is this idea that I'm hearing, might that be from God? From God's knows where? Can we humble ourselves to be able to listen, to hear voices that we don't understand, and instead of just disregarding them, or voices that disagree with us, and instead of just shouting them down, ask. I'm not saying every voice is from God. Y'all, there are some of them out there They are from the devil, if anything. But we can listen. We can hear. And we can ask the Spirit to help us know. Rather than our split-second reaction, rather than our guts guiding us, and our defensiveness raising our fists, we can listen. Is this a word from God? Is this an action from God? Is this something I need to hear? Is this something I need to do? That's a lot harder. It's a lot harder to live that way. When Jesus talks about the way is narrow and few go by it, it's because the easy way is just going through our automatic stuff, right? It's doing things the way we've always done them. That's the wide road. The narrow path, you have to pay attention. You have to look at every single step to make sure you stay on that path. And in the same way as we interact with the world, we have to pay attention. Make sure that we're listening for God's leading, listening for God's word, looking for God's action and being drawn by God to Jesus Christ. That is the way to eternal life. But it's hard to walk. It's hard to live from this posture of from God knows where. From this posture of to God knows where. But it is the way. It is the way for us to bring life, not only for ourselves, but for all the world. To bring life abundant and eternal. Amen. You're invited to answer that in whatever way you may choose. If you would like to come forward and make a profession of faith, you are invited to do that. If you would like to join together with this body of Christ. If you want to and you're online, place a comment. We'll catch up with you. That's the thing about the automatic stuff. It's so easy to do things. Joyce, I just got to say, that was awesome this morning, the way you included the online audience. I am struggling with that, and it is so important. We're doing things a new way. There are people who are not here, but are here. And sometimes it's easy to remember the people here and forget the people there. So if you're online you want to make a profession of faith or join with this body, you can do that too. Put a comment, send the church page a a DM. It's a direct message. And we'll get back in touch with you. If you want to rededicate your life, you're invited to do that. You can come forward and do it. You can do it in your own seat. But let's continue to seek God's guidance, God's pull on our lives. So we stand together and sing our communion hymn, Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ. Let's stand and sing.
when we come to the Lord's, su Lord's Supper, we are coming to find rest at a slow down, sit down meal where we are served rather than serving. Though we approach meals with a fast food mentality of getting and eating our food quickly so we can move on to the next thing, the Lord's Supper forces us to take a seat with others, pause, and take notice of what's set before us. When we set our minds on Jesus and his broken body and spilled blood for our sins, our souls are restored by what we have in Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this bread and this juice as reminders that you gave us Jesus, the most costly gift of all. Jesus gives us everything else we need. Help us to know when we need to slow down, take a breath, and even change our ways. Guide us through all that we do and give us strength to make a difference. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. For it was on the night that Christ was betrayed that during supper he took a loaf of bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat of it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, he blessed it, and he poured it, saying, This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim Christ's death and resurrection until he comes again. And sing our closing song, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. Let's stand as we're able.
seeking God's guidance and wisdom for your life and for your actions. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's get out there and give them heaven.